Okay, so we've gone from flannel shirts to short sleeve shirts to tank tops. It's warm and humid outside, and we are ready for chapter 31. The ship shone its warm light upon the crowd. All watched as the hatch opened. Speedy and George ran outside. Speedy threw his arms around Nell. Yay! And George punched her lovingly in the arm. You remember Max, Nell said. Hey, Max, Speedy yelled, full of enthusiasm, and gave Max a big hug. Hey, Speedy, Max said, wriggling free of the boy's arms. George ignored both his sister and Max. He stared at the disembodied hand. Hate, it, hate to break it to you, Nell, George said, but your boyfriend has a hand on his shoulder. He's not my boyfriend, Nell said, and her, she felt her cheeks redden. <clears throat> Glad you made it, kid, Badger snarled. Lefty left off Max's shoulder to shake Badger's hand. That's Lefty, Nell explained. Badger shook the bodiless hand without hesitation. Suddenly the air filled with distant shrieks. The sound, one of pain and one of stark terror, rattled them all deeply. <coughs> Sorry. For a moment, everyone was silent. Time is running out, Badger said. Come on, Nell, onto the ship. Nell said her goodbyes to the former skeletons who were still celebrating around the fire. Thank you, the bus driver said. Give my thanks to your, your whole organization. My organization, Nell said. Yeah, the fearless travelers, the bus driver said. I'm not, Nell started to say when Max cut her off. She means you're welcome, Max said, nodding at Nell. Nell and Max followed her brothers and Badger into the compass, and the hatch closed with a muffled whoosh behind them. Nell looked around, astonished at the ancient machine. <clears throat> Everything she looked, everywhere she looked, were colored knobs, blinking lights, control screens, and interesting trickets. Pinch took the controls, barking orders to Speedy and George with a loud countdown. The ship rumbled to life and lifted into the sky. Badger twisted a heavy valve and two deep brown leather chairs rose from the floor. He pulled down on a leather and a metal pipe with a round fire pit descended from the ceiling. Inside the pit, a small fire was already blazing. Badger nodded for Nell and Max to sit and handed them two steaming mugs of Traveler's Cocoa. We need to go to Vazencrack, Nell said, to save Ravenhead. Yes, Badger said. What else did you find out? Nell and Max sipped the warm liquid and all the cold vanished from their bodies. As they drank, they told Badger the whole tale of their escape from Dark Daughters and Crypt, their encounter with the clowns. When they explained about the trumpet, Badger's expression changed. He typically did not show much emotion, but it was clear he was beyond stunned. Is, is that the trumpet? Badger asked. Max nodded. M may I see it? Max nodded again and opened the lid. Badger stared into the case and shook his head in astonishment. Forget the fact that every time you play it, there is a good chance you will burst into flames. Or worse, do you have any idea how powerful this weapon is? What? Burst into flames? Nell shivered. <coughs> you might as well have been carrying around a ten-tom nuclear bomb. This is the trumpet of Ravenhead. Played correctly, this instrument has the power not just to change creatures into other creatures, but to alter the entire landscape of the dreamlands. It can twist time, bend fates, raise the dead, snuff out dreamers, and snatch things from Earth. This is not just any instrument, mind you. It is a weapon of the gods. Played correctly, it is devastating. Played incorrectly, the results are even worse. Ah, uh, hello now, a voice rang out over the speakers. It was Fen, her wolf-like ears able to hear through the walls. Smells like you brought the handless boy. Thank you. I've been waiting to take the other hand. No, Nell murmured, her body trembling. Why isn't Fen here? She is our prisoner, Badger explained. Lefty jumped from Max's shoulder, ran across the bridge to the door, and began to pound on it, anxious to attack. Badger scooped up the ringing hand. And fearless travelers treat our prisoners with compassion, he told the hand. It is our first rule. Hmm, interesting rule. But before I take his hand, first I'll take my stinking bird back. 
You stole it from me now, and now I'm going to pick off her feathers one by one. That will teach her to run away. Fenn's voice, cold as ice, crackled over the speakers. Don't you wonder what's going to happen to Fenn? <laughs> the little twip. Nell put her hands over her ears. Make her be quiet, please, she whispered. Even being on the same ship with the little dark daughter made her stomach hurt. After all, Nell had been through all she had seen. Fenn filled her with a deeper dread than she could explain. Oh, I wonder why. She patched into the speaker somehow. Pinch snarled. Go check on our prisoner, George, Badger said. Carefully, as though he were holding a newborn, he put the trumpet back in its case and closed the lid. And remember, George, don't talk to her or listen to her. Just check that she's not up to mischief. So I wonder what they're worried about talking to her. I wonder if they're worried about being kind like they've been in the past, if that will come back to get them. I wonder. Got it. George said, giving Badger an excited salute. I don't know, I get this funny feeling. Badger turned to Max and Nell. Here is our situation, he said. A spell prevents fearless travelers from entering Frisia Skull's castle. It will have to be you, Nell. Oh, of course. You'll have to enter and find Ravenhead. And me, Max said. And me, Speedy, Speedy added. And me, George said. Yes. All of you will need to go, but the most dangerous thing that awaits you is not the Dark Daughters, it's that trumpet. As dangerous as it is, I'm afraid you're going to have to play it again, Badger said to Nell. Even though it could kill us, Nell said nervously, yes. Why are you saying that, Speedy Moan? Because it's true. The trumpet is the only way to wake Ravenhead. I bet I could wake him, George said. A good flick on that beak would do it. Nobody can sleep through that. Go, Badger commanded, pointed to the door. Check on our prisoner. All right, George Huff. He exited the bridge. Everyone listened for a moment as George's curses echoed behind the closed door. Sorry, Nell shrugged. George soon ran out of curses, and he was immediately engulfed in the quiet hum of the engine. The noise vibrated off the metal of the long hallways and stairwells. George didn't like being alone down here. Walking along the narrow corridors of the ship, the dread grew until he reached the room where Fenn was being held. As George approached, he could see thin tendrils of yellow smoke escaping from under the crack of her door. What the heck are you doing? George asked, turning the heavy lever and letting himself into the room. Oh no! He coughed. The small room was full of thick yellow smoke. Half the room was a cell. Behind the thick bars, Ben Fenn stood on her bed. She was mumbling in a deep, guttural language, her small chest rising and falling with each yowling word. Mortia intunicara, minta mortia intunicara, minta. Yellow smoke poured out of her nose like a dragon. The acrid vapor smelled of burning plastic and burned George's eyes. Stop it, George said, struggling to breathe. Fenn chanted louder and louder. The smoke grew in thickness, and the sounds from her body became more demonic. So think of the root word or the base word, demonic, demon, evil. The smoke made George's head spin. His legs went numb, and he felt himself slipping. Everything seemed to be happening in slow motion. He tried to talk, but his mouth didn't work, and before he knew it, he hit the ground. He struggled to rise, but could not. His arms, like jello, all around him, hot globs of iron hit the ground and sizzled to the floor. Fenn was melting the bars with her breath. Now you will all die, Fenn cried, jumping off the bed and walking through the hole in the bars. Uh, with all his might, George stuck out his hand and grabbed hold of her leg. Fenn turned and let out a stream of scorching yellow smoke that burned his hand. He screamed in agony and lay on the ground, clutching his hand as she walked out the door. George tried to speak, to call out for help, but his mouth was frozen shut. Even if he could speak, no one would hear him. The ship had run into a storm and was heaving and shaking. On the bridge, all eyes were staring out the window at the sky. 
trying to comprehend the evil that awaited them. They had passed through the wall of dark purple clouds and were now flying low over the ice forest of Azencrack. It was a dead, windswept place of leafless trees, dripping with jagged icicles that sent up hollow chimes as the compass passed. Soon the forest grew thin, turning into an empty snow-caked plain that was led to a single mountain of black ice which watched over everything like a merciless prison guard. At the top <coughs> sat dark dawn, Frisia Skull's castle encased in fog. So I'm thinking about how stories go, and I'm and we're we're close to the end here, so I'm just hopping back to the beginning to the problem, just thinking about it. I think we've made it through the climax where they all got back together again. Um, I may be wrong, um, but I'm thinking that problem. Do you remember what the problem was? Yeah, getting Rose back. So the end, right? How stories tend to go. We usually circle back to that beginning problem. How does the story go? What's going to what's gonna happen to solve that problem? How are they going to get Rose back? How does Fen play into this? How does the evil castle and the kids going in there playing their trumpet, how is this all going to play into this and Ravenhead? At the moment, no one was looking at the wasteland of ice or the desolate mountain, but at the towering blood-red egg that hovered, hovered over dark dawn. That's right, that's what that red egg was. The egg appeared to be as large as the mountain itself. Its shell shivered with hot electric pulses of energy. Suddenly, the compass began to shake. Uh oh The engines groaned. We're losing power, Pinch screamed. The egg is draining us. The engines are dying. Dying? How can we fly without an engine? But for the moment, no one was thinking about the engine. All eyes were staring out the window at the great red egg floating above Frisia Skull's castle at the top of Icy Mountain. An ear-piercing crack rang out shaking the air around them as in the distance the eggshell shattered and millions of jagged pieces violently rained down upon the compass with spitting hisses. As the fog of shells cleared, what had hatched took their breath away. Floating of the pet castle was the plague dreamer. Ooh. He sat cross-legged and completely still. His long, thin face was bone white except for his lips, which were the pale blue of a drowned man. His long, his hair, long and scraggly, hung down to his shoulders from beneath a crown made of human skulls. Where does this guy get these ideas? His clothes were ragged and destitute, but his arms, folded in his lap, were powerful. At first, he seemed to be shivering, making his whole body look hazy and out of focus. As they get closer, a piercing buzz filled the air, and it became clear that the plague dreamer skin, clothes, and all, was made of a black tide of insects. It was just as they had seen in their visions at the diner. Oh, remember the diner? Gee, that seems like ages ago. When he finally stood and walked across the dreamlands, that tide of insects would be unleashed and devour everything in its path. Rose sat on the brim of Nell's bowler. She flew up to the window and let out a loud tweet of alarm trying to understand the sheer size of the beast towards which they were speeding. How can we stop it? Nell asked. You can't. Once my mother crushes the soul out of my little bird and the eclipse potion is all nice and poison-like, a needle gets sticked into Ravenhead's heart and we'll all watch him burn. He'll light up the sky as he flies, screaming right up into the plague dreamer, and that will wake him. Everyone's shocked. Oh, wait, let me read that again and see if you can figure out where that's coming from. How can we stop it? Nell asked. You can't. Once my mother crushes the soul out of my little bird. My mother? Whose mother? So it can't be Nell. Nell just said, how can we stop it? And someone is responding to her, talking about her mother, who crushes the soul out of a bird. Who has an evil mother? <laughs> Once my mother crushes the soul out of my little bird and the eclipse potion is all nice and poison-like, a needle gets sticked, sticked, that's interesting, sticked and not stuck, into Ravenhead's heart and we'll all watch him burn. He'll light up the sky as he flies screaming right up into the plague dreamer 
That'll wake him. Any idea who's talking? Everyone turned, shocked, to see Finn standing in the doorway with a foul grin. I tricked all you stupid idiots. <laughs> she giggled happily. She's not your bird, Nell said. She's my mother. Not anymore, Fenn said, and sucked the air into her lungs, and then blew a plume of yellow smoke from her thin lips. The sulfur cloud, so sulfur smells like rotten eggs. The sulfur cloud engulfed everyone in a hot, stinging fog that choked and blinded them. Badger screamed, unleashing his umbrella, though he could no longer see it. Through the fog, sparks of blue light flashed in sharp pulses, and the little silhouette of Fen was visible for only a few seconds as she shot this way and that through the chaos, her vision alone clear. The bird is mine! Grab her! Badger shouted. Whoosh! Nell felt a small body run past her through the blinding smoke. Rose was chirping wildly, sounding an alarm and Nell felt her leap from her shoulder. Rose! she shouted. Her eyes felt as though they were melting in her head. Soft feathers fluttered past Nell's cheek, and she held out her hand to grab her mother, but Rose was confused by the smoke and did not stop. Mine! Fen cried. Get off! Max grunted. He had Rose in his hand, and he and Fen were fighting. Max! Nell coughed through the blinding smoke. Where are you? There was a swish of metal moving through the air. Then Max let out a scream of intense pain, and Rose burst into a string of desperate squawks as Fen grabbed her in her sharp fingers. Max! Nell screamed again, spinning her head in every direction, trying to find her friend in the blinding fog. Fen gave a long, high whistle, calling for something that came instantly, and there was a crash with a shatter of glass. The smoke was sucked out of the broken window, draining itself from the bridge. All eyes, tearing and stinging, went to the slimy octopus that the Dark Daughters rode, which had entered the ship. It was slithering across the floor with writhing tentacles. Fen stood over Max. The boy lay on the flo floor, aw, moaning in agony as an ivory-handled knife stuck into his chest. All were watching, but none could move. The paralyzing poison from the, sp the smoke now fully in their blood. Fen held Rose in her dirty, nail-bitten fingers. Hello, Glen Glepnir, Fen said, kissing the bird on the head. Don't, Nell pleaded, for she knew what was about to happen, and she also knew she couldn't stop it. Nell tried to become calm. She looked into Fen's hay-filled eyes. Don't take her, Fen, please. She's my mother. You have a mother who loves you. I do, Fen said and smiled, a little girl's hopeful smile. And I'm going to make my mommy very happy. Then, moving with the explosive speed of a wild animal that had been pent up, Cage darted across the bridge, dove onto the back of the octopus, and shot out the window, the shrieking rose clenched tightly in her hand. <sighs> the air was clearing, and as it did, their minds and limbs came alive once again. Nell couldn't yet process that her mother had been taken. First, they had to deal with Max, who lay on the floor of the ship. Nell rushed over to his side. Lefty was touching Max's forehead. Nell was on her knees beside him. I'm waking up, Max said in disbelief, as his sleeper began to be pulled back into his human body. I don't want to go, he moaned. See, so remember that? Max was asleep. This is all his Max's dream. And he's saying now his body's waking up. Huh. It's okay, Nell said, trying to comfort him. You're going home. I'm waking, he repeated, unable to believe what was happening. You're fading. I'm right here, Nell said. She turned to Badger. Help me. Help me. What do we do? Badger just looked sadly Badger just sadly shook his head. There is nothing we can do now. Shut up. Shut up and help me. Please, you're a fearless traveler. There must be something in the book. Nell got out the book and frantically started flipping through the pages, but it was all blank. 
Badger's hand fell upon hers and closed the book softly. The book won't help you this time. He's waking, Badger said tenderly, looking into Nell's eyes. His sleeper is leaving the dreamlands and returning to his body. Please, Nell screamed. She threw the book across the room. Help me. Everyone wakes in the end, Nell. It comes to every sleeper. All wake back into their human bodies and forget most everything that happened to them in this world. That That is life, dream life, brief and beautiful. Nell, Max said weakly. His body was growing translucent, fading away. Lefty waved goodbye. It was a sad wave, the wave of leaving, to those boarding trains to far off places from which there is no return. Max grabbed hold of his friend with his good hand not wanting to let go, but even he could not stop him from fading. And pop. A bright flash of light exploded, and in an instant the hand was gone. Lefty! No! No! Max moaned in horror. He turned to Nell, his eyes wide and his voice growing weak. There was no stopping it now. He was waking, plucked from this world where his friend Nell remained. Take the case, Max said. His voice was growing fainter, as if he were falling. He touched the trumpet, but saw with terrified eyes that the case was disappearing with him. Oh, no. Where am I? Max gasped, his, far, his voice far away. Where am I? His body was becoming as see, th as see through as glass. It looks like the hospital. Shh, Nell cooed, holding back tears that were filling her eyes. I'll come back, Max said. I'll travel through the dreamlands and the wicked places and find my way back to you, he said with his final bit of strength as a bright flash of light engulfed him with a sizzle. When Nell's eyes adjusted, Max and the trumpet case had disappeared. The ivory-handled knife clattered to the floor. Nell stayed for a while on her knees, staring at the place where Max had been. Her friend was gone. So suddenly, so completely, in just a flash of light, he was no longer in this world. And now, she realized, Rose was gone as well. Gone, she snarled. Gone. The word itself, so terrible, so finely, so different than the slam of a door or the close of a coffin lid, Nell turned to Badger and, without warning, ran at him with her fists curled. Ooh! Ah! She screamed and punched him in his chest. He looked at her in surprise. I'm sorry, Nell. Don't talk to me, Nell shouted. None of you talk to me. She walked to a chair and turned away from them all. For a moment, no one spoke. Finally, awkwardly, as if for no reason other than to break the terrible silence, Speedy asked, Why did the case disappear? It belongs to the last person whose lips touched it, Badger said. What are we going to do now? George asked Nell. Nell didn't answer. She stood and wiped her eyes, and no one spoke. The only sound was the wind rushing in from the broken window. Finally, she shook her head, steadfast and defiant. She was not going to just sit by and do nothing. She let out another scream, bursting with anger, raw and wild. Ah! Nell, Badger said calmly, listen to me. We will fix it. What? Nell snarled, facing him. Don't scream? That it? Why not? Girls can scream. We don't need to be polite. And we don't need to wait for someone to fix it. No one needs to help us. We can fight back. And that is what is going to happen. I am going to get my mom and take her home. Badger walked forward, put his large arms around Nell, and gave her a hug. He held her by the shoulders, his expression full of pride and wonder. Of course you will, Nell Perkins. Of course you will. Now show me how you scream. Nell smiled and let out her loudest scream. She looked at her brothers, and they joined her. For a few moments, they all screamed, screamed in anger until they felt ready to take on anyone and anything. But it all came to an end when the engines groaned mournfully as the entire ship began falling. Strap in, Pinch screamed. We're going to crash. Everyone scrambled into a seat. 
the compass bound and jostled through the air as it fell from the sky, and with a tremendous wham it smacked, smashed into the hard-packed snow and slid across the ice, downing trees and sending great plumes of white into the air. For a moment, all was very silent and very cold. The impact had stunned them all. Nell's ears were ringing, her vision blurry. In a few seconds, sensation smashed upon her like a wave. Is everyone all right? Badger asked. Nell felt okay. No worse off for the crash. She looked at Speedy. He nodded. We're fine. Go find George, Badger instructed Speedy. Pinch, start checking on the damage. I can already tell you we're down for a while. Badger thought for a moment until the solution became clear. They'll go by Silverback, he said. By Silverback? Pinch repeated, confused. How in the world do you plan to do that? You know how. I'll have to feed him myself. No, Duke, you can't, Pinch commanded. We don't have a choice. Badger said no more and began to pack up a few things. After a few silent moments, George walked into the bridge. He was a little banged up and his hand was burned. Badger applied some ointment, quickly healing it. Following Badger's instructions, the three children exited the ship. They were in a desolate place, a lonely and terrible place. There was nothing save for the rush of cold wind blowing across a vast ice-bound land. I knew this hunk of junk couldn't fly, George said, his body shivering. With a crisp thwack, Nell opened her umbrella. Her brothers huddled under the warm light. Nell kept touching her bowler, hoping to find Rose, but there was no trace of her tiny feet or soft shoulders. It felt so strange not having Rose with her now. She felt so alone. How she missed her little red head and excited cheeps. You think Mom's okay? Speedy asked. Nell said nothing. She kept her eyes steady on the plague dreamer, floating seren serenely over Frisia Skull's towering castle of black glass, waiting to awaken and spread disease through the world and the ne this world and the next. She has to be, she said, staring straight ahead. She has to be. A hatch in the back of the compass opened, and Badger and Pinch carefully led a silverback clown down the ramp by a leather br bridle. The half-horse, half-motorcycle was without power, dark and soundless. The heavy tires made thick tracks across the snow. It was the first time that Nell and George had seen a silverback. Even now, powered down as it was, it radiated a deep power and seething menace. What is that? It's a silverback, Speedy said. It's one of the engines of the ship. It's interesting he gets this word silverback. Silverback, I think that's the word, is um, the alpha male gorilla of mountain gorillas. Griffin, if you're watching this, is that true? Go on, Pinch insisted and nodded toward Badger. Say your goodbyes. Nell turned to Badger, who was adjusting the silverback saddle. Does she mean you? Nell asked, her stomach fluttering. Why won't we see you again? Badger did not answer the question. Instead, he gave instructions. You three must make it to Vazercrack. Excuse me. You must climb the mountain, make your way inside the castle. Oh, like as easy as that. And save your mother before Frisia Skull uses her to kill Ravenhead and awaken the plague dreamer. I can't tell you how to do it, only that you mustn't fail. Stop it, Nell said hotly. Just answer me. Why won't we see you again? Badger reached out and took Nell's hand in his own. He looked deep into her eyes and gave her a sad smile. The ship is dead. We'd never make it on foot. The only way is to ride across the wastelands on silverback. We can only give power to one silver, but that is fine. It can carry all three of you. But in order to run, it needs fuel. It runs on nightmares, Badger explained. Nightmares? No, repeated, confused. That's right. I don't understand. What does that have to do with you, Nell said. I will be the fuel, Badger admitted. How? How can you be the fuel, Nell said. It takes nightmares. When I was young, I made a lot of mistakes. I was shaped accordingly. Badger pulled a small vial from his boot and popped the cork. A medicinal scent perfumed the air. With a steady hand, he lifted the vial to his lips and drank. His body clenched. 
His eyes closed and he screamed a violent scream as though something elemental was being ripped from his body. Spidery webs of energy crawled all over him as he began to transform. Before their eyes, he became a creature, shadowy and electrical, with sharp red eyes, long razor-sharp claws, a human's body, and the head of an animal. Huh, can you guess what animal? A badger. Fierce and terrible. And Nell knew at once she was no longer looking at a man, but at something else entirely. <gasps> You're a nightmare, Nell gasped. No, I was a nightmare, he growled, his voice rough and terrible. Oh, so are we going to find out who Badger is? Right? All your guesses way back when? Hmm. Who did we think he was? Father of Nell? Father of Rose? Married to the Dark Daughters? Father of Fen, all these guesses we had. I found the night. So let, let me go back to the beginning of the paragraph. No, I was a nightmare, he growled, his voice rough and terrible. I found the night and was reshaped into a dream. But my can't, past can't ever be completely washed away. I learned to control the nightmare inside of me, and right now I need to summon it, he roared at his, as his body became a great black fog. The fog swirled violently, a mini tornado that fluttered the children's clothes and swept over the dead-eyed silverback, entering its ears and mouth and disappearing inside. The creature's dark eyes glowed red as it came to life and let out a loud whinny. So a whinny, you know, that is like a horse. <laughs> Get on, Pinch said, not wanting to waste any time. Badger is a nightmare? Nell asked in disbelief, her eyes wet with tears. Don't cry, Pinch said. Years ago, he left all that behind and wandered alone in the darkest, most lonely places, searching out the wisdom of the most ancient dreamers. He remembered who he was and became what he was born to be, a fearless traveler. And now it is your turn to be yourself. You won't let us down, will you? No, Nell sniffed. Who are you? Pinch asked. A girl who is trapped in a wicked place, has messed up everything, lost her mother, and is afraid. If that's who you think you are, that's who you will be. Now stop feeling sorry for yourself. You've come this far, so tell me who you are. Nell took a deep breath. The wind was whistling softly all around them, and in the great distance, the plague dreamer rumbled. All right, what does she say? Yell it. I am Nell Perkins. And you won't forget it, Pinch nodded. No, Nell whispered. And you will find your way home, Pinch snarled. The three children climbed onto Silverback. Nell sat in front, holding the reins. Speedy sat in the middle, holding the umbrella, protecting them from the punishing cold. And George rode in back. How do I ride it? Nell asked. You don't, Pinch said. You just hang on tight. It will do the rest. Just tell it where it needs to go. You can't come? Speedy asked. My duty now is to protect the ship, but we need you. You've come this far, said Pinch. You'll be fine. Nell lifted her eyes to the vast snowy plain that stretched out before them and the awful plague dreamer that reached across the sky. There was no turning back. Her mother was there in the castle, and if Nell fell to rescue her, not only would the Perkins children lose their mother, but Ravenhead would die, the plague dreamer would wake, and everyone would be plunged into never-ending terror. Take us to Vazencrack, Nell said to the creature. At first, the silverback didn't make a sound, but suddenly its wheels began to spin, spraying snow in the air, and with an explosive rumble, and shot off across the ice toward all that lay ahead. That's the end of chapter 31. And I'm thinking I was totally wrong on the climax of this story. All right, um, I'll upload this, and then I'll come back and read chapter 32. Same place, same clothes, so you'll have to dig a little. All right, see you guys.